Welcome to another episode of Let's Be Mindful. So today I have a special guest. I actually have a client who's going to share her story, her story of a journey through her and love, rediscovering herself and her going through her healing journey. So I want Jessica Vargas, if you don't mind, Jessica, if you would introduce yourself to our audience. Sure. Um, well, first, thank you. Thank you for having me, V. Um, my name is Jessica Vargas and I am on I'm a single empty nester on a journey to find um, my purpose and what brings me joy and happiness and creating the life that I want. So uh, as a, my professional career, I, I do, I'm an IT project manager uh, for a bank and I sit on a several boards within the community. One is the Gulf Coast Minority Chamber, um, which I put the emphasis on supporting and uplifting small businesses. So. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. And the reason why I wanted you to come on the show, because I do believe your story needs to be heard. Um, you've gone through a lot and um, and I think it's it'll resonate with so many people. OK, so, Jessica, let's start with um, how long were you married? OK, I was um, married legally for 22 years. OK, now, how many years were you with him? Um, probably a, it was a year when we started dating, when he proposed and a year later. So 24 total to. Wow. Okay. With the same person now, um, I'm going to say girl, instead of using his real name, let's just call him. We, we're just going to uh, say ex-husband. Okay. We just going to, I don't want to put his real name out there. We're going to keep That's the personal fine. identifying information private. Okay. So in your marriage to him, um, would you say that it was a happy 22, 24 years? No, <laughs> no, um, okay. there was happy times, um, okay. but um, the, the toxic areas of our marriage were probably greater than the good time. Okay. So I know that since your divorce, because you're newly divorced, and I really want to deep dive into the marriage. Um, now, I've had people on my show talk about narcissism, and I've even talked about it. And I could tell you one thing, girl, like, it's been many times I did not know what it was. I just knew something was off in my marriage. And I say that repeatedly. Like, I didn't know what, girl, I, if you would have asked me 15, 20 years ago, like, what's the narcissist? Girl, I would have thought that it was somebody who beats you up physically every single day. Like, I didn't know what it was. Mm -hmm. Now, since you've gotten divorced, you had been, you know, you've gone through a lot of trauma because you were married to a... um um, somebody who was heavily <laughs> narcissistic, right? Um, because a lot of people are throwing that word out here and it's not, sometimes they're just assholes, but you were legit married to somebody who was a narcissist. Um, in your marriage, what are some cues that looking back at it, because anybody could look back and say, oh, well, I could have done this and could have done that. But if you look back at it, like what are some heavy cues that you knew something wasn't right in your marriage to your ex-husband? Um, one thing that like really bothers me to this day that I didn't acknowledge it, but I saw it was, um, the ruining of special occasions or events out of the blue. So let's just say, um, I don't know, Easter, we went out as a family with our children, happy marriage, right? We go out to the, say the aquarium and everything's going great until, um, my ex-husband didn't get his way or wasn't in control or wasn't the center of attention. And then there was either an argument, a fight, something that happened that would ruin that occasion for my children and myself. Um, so that was one of the one of the biggest ones I right, looking back. And also me being the brunt of jokes all the time. Mm. Uh, Meaning, with, what does that mean? Um, so like things that would just make me happy or make me laugh, you know, my ex-husband would diminish that or make it seem uncool or you know tease me and make the children laugh at me you know because and it kind of makes you feel small and it's like so for example right um I'm a jeep girl I, I like my jeeps you know I find them fun I'm a fun person and you get ducked with um jeeps and I was just telling the story about ducks and how other jeeps and it's just really cool and for me it just makes me smile when I get a duck so when I got my first Doug, I was super excited and I went and shared that. And he was like, that really makes you like happy, you know? And I'm like, wow, mm -hmm. you know? And mm -hmm. it was just that diminishing 
why does it bother you that something so small makes me happy and you're not trying to acknowledge something that small, you know, makes me happy. You know what I mean? So, oh yeah, those are the kind of things I dealt with. Now, how was he as a father? Um, as a father, I will. One, one thing I'll never take away from him is he was a great provider. He mm-hmm. worked. He made sure, you know, bills were paid, food on the table, mm-hmm. you know, all the things a provider should do. So he was an excellent provider. Extra uh, wasn't his thing. So when I say extra, if my kids wanted to do football or mm-hmm. cheer or acting, which all three of them at some point did something, <laughs> um, mm-hmm. that was totally on me. He wouldn't pay for uniforms. He wouldn't pay for tuition. I mean, unless I was really short and I needed it, then, you know, I would get it. Either I would take it from our account, our joint accounts or, but Mm -hmm. asking him for money to pay for it or to have that as a regular bill was never his thing. Going to practices with his kids, never his thing. Going to their games or their, you know, work was always priority. I know you and I talked about, and I don't know if you remember this, um, even though Jessica is a client and has been a client, I have known Jessica a very long time. And when we used to live near each other um, in the same state, we no longer live. I don't, we, neither one of us live in that state anymore, but the one memory I would have of you many years ago, because you left, you know, the state of Maryland a long time ago. Mm-hmm. But we used to go to Zumba. Remember, we used to yeah. go to Zumba and we actually mm-hmm. met in um, an exercise class. It was about That's 16 weird. years ago because my youngest son is 16 now. And but I remember we would go to Zumba. We love Zumba. And a couple of times I would ask you to go uh, and you would say, yes, I would go. But then you would hit me up right before Zumba started. And he didn't want you to go to Zumba and offer the life of me. I agree because I'm, you know, I'm really close to my father and I would tell my father, I'd be like, huh, is it a cultural thing? You know, because, you know, I'm like, she, but she wanted to go. And I noticed that I'm like, something might be a little off because Mm -hmm. Zumba brought you joy and then you wanted to go. And then all of a sudden, I don't know if you shared that with him. And then he was like, no, you can't go, you know, stay big like me. Like, I don't know. You know, I just don't know how that was, but do you remember those days, Jessica? Yeah, absolutely. Um, that was all my marriage. I think, you know, and you know, part of it, and I get, and we'll probably get into it more is I had to do a lot of self-discovery by myself, you know, because he is a narcissist. He was, and still is. Um, but I had to also come to a healing to understand where I was allowing certain things to be done to me or behaviors. And i made them acceptable, you know? Mm-hmm. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I feel like he definitely controlled me having friends, going out, um, and, and and he had his own insecurities, in which kind of really led up to the divorce, um, a lot of those insecurities. Was one of the insecurities is because he was super short? <laughs> um, I don't know if that was one of them, <laughs> possibly, you know, I've been on my healing journey for three years. Um, okay. Mm-hmm. That's where I, and I've been in Florida for eight years, right? Um, so... I was three years, and this was like right pre-COVID, like just remembering, like we went to Paris, it wasn't romantic to me. I had business, the house, the car, the kids, you know, vacation. Like I had what the, you know, American dream sells you as what's the life you want to live. And I'm living it, but inside I'm miserable. And I knew Mm -hmm. that something was off. And and that's where I just started to self-discover that Mm -hmm. one, I did not really like my husband. Um, Mm -hmm. I didn't like the person he, he is. And two, I started to discover that I didn't love me. I loved him more than Mm -hmm. I loved me. And I loved my kids Mm -hmm. more than I loved me. And I created this this environment where I was last. And I had to do for everyone else, but I I created it, right? So at some point, you have to look back and say, dang, girl, you're the one that taught them that your needs are last. I started discovering that. I started Mm -hmm. to to express that and communicate that. And um, I did. And when I started communicating that, I felt unvalued and unappreciated in the marriage, you know, um, mm-hmm. is when all hell broke loose <laughs> and, you know, the mm-hmm. about. but, um, you know, I, I can sleep well at night knowing I tried everything to save my marriage. But looking back, like, 
it was my job to figure out what I wanted. So yeah, I've taught you this. Well, now guess what? I want this. I want to be treated like mm -hmm. this. I want boundaries. I want, you know, and that was hard for him and my children to this day are still my children and they're adult, young adults. I'm mm -hmm. still struggling with me putting myself first and they're not the center of my universe anymore. Where do you think that came from? You putting everybody else before yourself. Where, where do you think that so, came from? That came from childhood, um, childhood trauma. I, I I was diagnosed with codependency, which is still, you know, in the mental health world, debatable on if it's considered a mental health, um, you know, or not compared mm -hmm. to, you know, maybe some other mental disorders. But codependency is a real thing uh, where you're taught, like, in order to receive love, you have to continue to serve and do things for someone. I also grew up not knowing which way my parent, my parent, because I was a single family home, mood was going to be any different day. So you live, you live on this world of chaos where you never know what to ex expect or what behavior to expect from your parent that day. So you, you, you grow up living in this anxiety of eggshells like you never know. And that was normal to me. That was what normal felt like. You know, mm -hmm. so it's weird for someone who doesn't, you know, who, who doesn't have those kind of issues when you're trying to be in peace, being peace sometimes is, doesn't feel normal for me, you know, mm -hmm. and I'm learning to embrace that. Like that's something my body needs, but I've been taught that chaos is normal. So I'm mm -hmm. learning that has been probably the biggest challenge. I know in our discussions. You know, our behaviors and who we are today come from our childhood, right? I grew up to, I grew up in a very like secure environment. Um, my mom and dad are still married. You know, I had a secure growing up. You know, I knew, you know, my mom and dad loved me. They were there for me. But then I got divorced from a narcissist. And then I noticed, wait a minute, something's off here, right? Not that I craved like um, chaos but I feared intimacy. Now your childhood sounds like it created the anxious attachment style within you, mm -hmm. which is a, we get because that parent, our main provider is very up, down, up, down, it's inconsistent. Mm -hmm. And so it creates in us, like, I mean, you think when somebody's very inconsistent, it's going to make you have high anxiety because it's like, uh, I don't know what to do, you know, because yeah. you're, you're, whole world you're depending and the thing is you're depending on that person and because mm -hmm. you're depending on that person to fulfill your needs they create within you an anxious attachment style Correct. so in your marriage would you say that you know um that was reflected in your marriage like were you up and down you know like um his moods would dictate your mood kind of because if he was a certain way did you then feel a certain way because he felt a certain way yeah, absolutely. And and that was something else I had to, I'm learning, I'm still learning as a codependent is I'm no longer, I'm not responsible for anybody else's emotions or how they feel about decisions that I make about myself. I lived a life where I made decisions based on how someone else felt about me. If my friend invited me to the gym to go and I knew it was going to upset him, then that would not go because I didn't, I wanted to keep the, try to keep the peace at home. So yeah, it definitely dictated a lot of relationships my career, things I wanted to focus on, you know, helping build his business when I could have been focusing on my own career, you know, and th those are just different things because, you know, I didn't want to, um, you know, rock the boat. I wanted to mm -hmm. continue, you know, having what I wanted was like a perfect family. And, and I know that's unobtainable, right? But that was something that I had desired. I wanted the house with the kids and a lovely family, but you know, it was all, all a facade. I created this fake, you know, smoke and mirrors what people would see as my family yep. and see them go to church on Sunday and, mm -hmm. and you know, behind closed doors were, you know, cursing, fighting, you know, not doing anything of what we're learning mm -hmm. on Sunday morning. So here's the thing, you know, even though I've known you a, a long time, right? Uh, just as you said, I didn't know everything that was going on until you started coming to me, right, with the things and I'm trying to help you through it. But yeah, you did a really good job in keeping that, like you said, facade up. Y'all were in church every Sunday. And I remember I even went to church with you a few Sundays. I do remember now you bringing memories back. I do remember <laughs> that. But I had no idea everything that was going on, you know, because the thing is, we 
we're not sharing. You know, there are a lot of people who are suffering in silence, right? And they don't have to, like, you don't have to. You don't have to tell the whole world, but to suffer in silence isn't a healthy thing either. So on the outside looking in, I'm like, damn, she don't want to go to Zumba, but I thought she loved Zumba. We love, you know, reggaeton. Like, you know, we, you and I have that in common. And I was like, what? She don't want to, you know, I didn't get it at the time, but then, you know, years later, if we have the discussion, I'm like, you know what? I noticed, I noticed you were putting everybody ahead of yourself. Mm -hmm. I noticed that. So let's talk about you helping build his business. Because again, as somebody who's known you for many years, you were putting all of your money into building his business. So how did that even work? So to be clear, I am the kind of woman that, you know, I'll I'll take anything and make it great, including my partner. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. I felt like we were moving to Florida for my career. You know, it was an opportunity mm -hmm. for us to give my kids what I thought at the time. And that's a whole nother topic for another time. That was another lesson to be learned. What I thought I was giving my kids, you know, the better life, picket fans, you know, I'm, I'm going to live in the suburbs, send them to better schools, which again, not necessarily the case, but it was something I had to learn. Um, and then when we came down here, you know, he gave up his job and then he got deathly ill in the middle of this. So mm -hmm. in the middle of our transition from relocating, he got deathly ill where me and the kids had to temporarily move back up north while he healed um, before we could come back to Florida. And I was just thankful for my job at the, the, the time because um, I was able to work from the hospital and all that good stuff. But when we relocated and he started to heal, he wasn't sure he wanted to work for someone else. He wanted to, he talked about getting an ice cream truck or a food truck. And um, I knew he always loved cooking. So I kind of helped push him. You know, I was like, you should totally do that. Like, um, I will say he did like the bulk of the start of the business was his 401k that he closed out from his last job. Just so it's clear, I want to make sure I'm telling facts because you know how narcissists do. They like to tell their side of the story. There's always a different mm -hmm. side. But um, he did start, you know, took all of his 401k and invested it in the in the business. But with that being said, I helped him with I, with everything. I mean, with, um, you know, marketing, the administrative side, filing mm -hmm. for paperwork. I mean, there's a lot that goes into a business from an operation standpoint that a lot of people don't understand, especially when it comes to food. I mean, there's a lot of regulations and certifications and there's a lot of things that go into that. So we, we started as a food truck and I was the one by his side. Working at some festivals, we were didn't sleep for like 24 hours getting ready. I was the original dishwasher working, about, you know, and then we continued to grow the business year after year. We increased and then we ended up with he ended up getting the brick and mortar without me even signing. So he made that decision without me. So that's where I kind of understood it wasn't our business. Plus, he named the business after himself. It wasn't <laughs> Jessica and his. It was just his. So that was another sign, right? Like, this was just his. But I continued to support him, you know, work for him for free. Even after we started to really grow where we were not hiring people. I think we had, there was a point where we had, like, 10 to 15 employees. This was pre-COVID. Um, we, we had a good thing going, and we were able to even hire. I could spend less time working the mm -hmm. second job again i'm doing all this while i have a full-time job so to me i had two full-time jobs and i was still raising kids at the time because my kids are 22 21 and 18 so they just recently become became adults in the past three or four years with that being said yeah all the money from the business went right back into the business now to be clear i had access to the business account so i definitely mm -hmm. took funds when i needed them um to pay bills when I was short or to, to cover my daughter's cheer expense if I had to. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, he would bitch and complain, but he would get over it quick because we had the funds. It wasn't, I wasn't mm -hmm. getting paid. Then last September, 2022, he introduced me to a woman that he met um, where he got his oil changed to hire her. Mind you, I've been fighting with him to pay me, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Pay me to, you know, he got put on the book, so he ended up starting eventually getting paid then through payroll, through the business. Um, and I still wasn't getting anything from the business. Okay, mm -hmm. no, let's talk about it. You Now, you said that he, he introduced you to this woman. Um, do you think at that time, like, they were having an affair or working together led to an affair? I don't know. 
And, and honestly, after like months after the divorce, I still keep hearing different rumors that that's not the woman. It was actually our employee that I personally knew. So honestly, I don't even know what to believe anymore. But what I do know is that um, I took him to marriage counseling through my journey. I was like, look, I don't feel valued and appreciated. And if we don't do something, this marriage is going to end. So in true narcissist fashion, he agreed to go to marriage counseling to be in attendance, not to really do the work. I'll, I'll never forget the, 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 when I found out about the affair. So Columbus weekend, what artist was it? Mary J. Blotch was performing the weekend after my birthday, which was like uh, the 14th, 15th, I don't know, that weekend. And I had told him, let's go for, away for the weekend. New Orleans is only three hour drive from here. Take me to see Mary J. Like, We'll have a, you know, we'll have a nice little weekend. It's my birthday. Like mm -hmm. he comes home maybe a few days after I tell him about the concert and he books a food trick gig that the same weekend. Mm. So what did I do was again, I'm in my self healing. I'm in my self learning. I've expressed what I wanted and mm -hmm. he disregarded what I wanted. So I went and bought me Mary J. Blige tickets I hit on his card. <laughs> like I got me Mary J. Blige. I went with a girlfriend and we went and we had a great time. Well, because he booked the food trick the weekend before, he made for me, that was my weekend, which was Columbus Day weekend. Originally, we were supposed to go out of, um, to up to DC to visit family. But with Thanksgiving coming, I canceled the trip and was like, you know what, let's just go up there for Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. um, so we ended up doing a staycation, staying local. And the whole time, he did not want me to let his ma our manager of the restaurant know that we didn't go to DC which I found really weird because I'm like, like, why? Like, why do you give a F where, uh -huh. she, where we are? We're her boss. Like, I, I don't understand. Mm -hmm. And I just dismissed it. I didn't think nothing of it. Um, but we spent that weekend together um, and we came up with a plan for our future. We were going to get the business ready to sell and um, buy commercial property that was a multiple businesses so we can like like mm -hmm. be owners of a property, like a strip mall, right? Mm -hmm. And we could get income that way, which would take, there's a lot of manual labor that goes into a restaurant business and catering. That's a lot of hard manual labor. And he was a sick mm -hmm. man and I was unhappy. I didn't want to live my life every weekend working festivals. Like, dude, I'm getting old too. Like, I want to enjoy life. Mm -hmm. You know, we've worked so hard in our lives. I want to start to enjoy some of it. And that was the weekend. So that was our plan. Sunday, October 9th, 2022. We left that weekend. We had a plan for our future. October 10th, the next day, is when I busted him at a hotel through GPS location with another woman. I didn't know who the woman was at the time. Mm -hmm. um, but I was waiting for him all day because it was Columbus Day. I worked for a bank, so I didn't work that day. But I was waiting for him because I was ready to get to work. Anybody who knows me, I'm a person of action. Let's get it done. Let's do it. And mm -hmm. I was ready to work that day. He had a doctor's appointment in Mobile, Alabama mm -hmm. that morning. He didn't mm -hmm. want me to go with him. He was acting really different until mm -hmm. finally I was like, let me just run to the mall. Because I also, on my birthday, that following Thursday, I was getting inducted into the Gulf Coast Minority Chamber Board of Directors. So I wanted mm -hmm. to get an outfit, you know, and look nice for that day. It was my birthday. Mm -hmm. So I went to the mall and something, and, and to this day I'll say it's God, universe, whatever, told me mm -hmm. to check his location. Mind mm -hmm. you, this is something I do on a regular. Like, I really thought he knew what he had. Like, at this point, we're getting older. What do we got to be doing to me messing around? Mm -hmm. Sure enough, he was at, uh, what was it, a, a Days in, <laughs> Days in in Mobile, Alabama. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the toxic Jessica was like, no, this mother effer isn't. And I got in my car and I started driving to that location. Mm -hmm. And what you could tell his location was off because it hadn't moved for an hour. My phone calls kept going to voicemail. So I just started heading that way. Well, I had the GPS up on my car and I saw he started moving. Mm -hmm. So I called him. I called him. And the first thing I said was, before you think about lying, just know I already know. So now who you with and what you doing? And mm -hmm. like, oh, it sounds like someone's guilty and is ha is 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 guilty of their own stuff that you're accusing me. Is that what he said? That was his response. I kind of everything else was more of a blur. I probably cursed his ass out, telling him to go get his stuff, blah blah blah. You know, mm -hmm. whole, you know. Sometimes you know, I definitely am one that's been worked on my reacting skills because uh, I'll tell you what, my reaction was 
Mm-hmm. Now, it was very toxic. It was very bad. Um, mm-hmm. But fast forward to the next day. We don't talk. I'm, I'm sleeping in the guest room. I'm getting ready for work. I'm not going to let him stop me. I get over work, start getting pretty because mm-hmm. I know I'm beautiful. I'm going to get dressed up, go to work. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I started playing a song. I should have cheated by Keisha Cole. <laughs> <laughs> While he's in the bedroom, I'm in the bathroom, like the master bathroom. Like I went in there to get ready. I know I'm petty as hell. But he goes, he, then he gets up, starts getting ready for work, goes to his car, comes back. Mind you, he didn't get home the, that night. When I called him at the hotel, it was probably like 4 p.m. ish. He didn't get mm-hmm. home until like 9 o'clock that night. Mm, mm. Didn't want to discuss nothing, which was cool. I wasn't in no space to discuss either. He goes to his car and comes back in and throws a bag of Michael Core, two purses and a couple wallets, and tells me, This is what I was doing shopping for your birthday. Yes, this is why I can never buy you anything nice because <laughs> you're um you're so nosy. And my response- they sell them purses at Days In. I didn't know that. I had no idea they were well, selling them purses. My response was, "Show me the receipts, and that'll tell me exactly what time you bought those purses." Do you think I saw a receipt? I haven't seen a receipt to this day. Now, everybody out there, I mean, if you want a Michael Kors purse, you know where to go. Days In in Mobile, <laughs> Mobile, Alabama. Ain't that what Forrest Gump said? Oh my gosh. Okay, yeah. so. Now, wait, I want to back up because you said something. You said um, he didn't want somebody to know that y'all were going to D.C. Is That's who he was in a hotel with? To this day, I can't confirm whether it was the other chick that he wanted to hire in September or if it was our manager. But I will say there was different clues even after our divorce that led me to believe it was our manager. Like someone that I brought into our business that I found on Facebook that was a baker and brought her into our business. So there was different signs that went on, you know, like he had her laptop, our photographer for our family pictures had a balance. And um, it took, in order to get all the pictures, mind you, I had already paid like three or $500 or whatever it was to hold the session. If he wanted it, we had to pay, I forget what it was, a couple more hundred or whatever. He po- she, he, my photographer posted pictures I guess he did a photo session for my manager at the time of the business, her daughter, Sweet 16, the one that he's alleged had the affair with. For me, that was, wait, you're paying our family balance so that she can have access to our photography. Make it make sense. Have you ever talked to her um, at all since? So she since was actually the first person I called when I found out he was in a hotel with another woman. And what happened? Joe have affair? No. That was her response. So she's never owned up to it. No, and he never has. Well, he never denied it. So there's a couple more things that happened. Like there was a a festival. Mind you, we both work in the community, so we're bound to see each other. But this particular one was a Latin festival. I'm big in the Latin community, especially sitting on the board of the Gulf Coast Minority Chamber. I tend to attend Latin events. Well, this particular event, my best friend was coming to town, who's friends with him still, friends with me. And we agreed to just be cordial that, you know, because my niece is his sister with, which is my ex-sister-in-law with her kids, you know, then my nieces and nephews were in town. Mm -hmm. But when I was around him and the food truck and the food tent, she kept looking at me evil. And again, I'm oblivious. I didn't even think it was her. You know what I'm saying? But she's grilling me and rolling her eyes at me. And, and, and And that's when it hit where I'm like, why is she so mad at me? What did I do to her? Like I couldn't, I couldn't figure it out. And then um, one day I was over at his house and he was fighting with me a couple of days before that to give him access to our Netflix. So that was one thing I pulled off. Oh, you you want to be an asshole? I took everything. Like <laughs> you don't even got access to Prime, nothing. So I was like, if you give me the twenty dollars, then I'll put Netflix back on. But he invited me a couple days later to dinner with our daughter to have dinner at his house. He's been lonely. He would like company for dinner. So I'm like, sure, no problem. I go. So he happens to be on the TV on Netflix. And guess who's Netflix he's on? Hers. And it was just like, really? Mm. And he just looked at me and I looked at him. 
And I know I said something really smart. I can't remember because it was really toxic. But um, I ended up leaving. And that was the last time I ever really effed with him again. Because mm. for me, uh, and I did ask him. And he never, uh, he never said he did, but he never said he didn't. Mm, of he course. Asked, and he texted me. And, you know, and maybe that is why he's so sick. That guilt really will eat up at you. Because he did text you, me. Yep. He, was like, he was like, you keep thinking it's one person and it's not. It's somebody else. And I finally just got to the point where I was like, you are just a shitty person that I don't need in my life. Point blank. Mm -hmm. And then that's when I just started blocking him on everything and just, Jessica, you need to move on. It, it, and it, I got to that point where it was like, okay, this isn't a healthy attachment to someone. This is nope. an unhealthy attachment. And I had mm -hmm. to acknowledge that. So in order to get healthy, I had to, you know, what they say is like, um, starve the, the narcissist. You have to just starve them. That's the yep. only way to kill it. That's how I started just healing from that. And then, you know, then I went to Ghana, which was another story, but, um, yeah, it's just been healing after healing after healing. And mm -hmm. now I can talk about it without even crying, which I think is mm -hmm. a little more confirmation that I am healing, you know? Mm -hmm. Now, okay. First of all, you said a lot and, uh, I'm going to say with the healing, um, be mindful then enter the picture, but, <laughs> but I remember us going back years ago, right? And we laugh about it and, and we probably laughed probably too soon after <laughs> when you came to my house and remember you and your uncle, wasn't it your uncle? <laughs> it was my ex husband's uncle. Yes. yes, yes. Oh, okay. Yep. You guys, <laughs> when I threw, I threw my ex-husband. <laughs> Y'all y'all came over and helped me change the locks. And you said there were hangers in the bushes. <laughs> because I had threw it. <laughs> it was closed outside. I didn't give a damn what the neighbor saw. Girl, I just I threw them outside. Mm -hmm. And y'all came and changed the locks for me. And that was actually the second time that um because the first time I had to, I hired a professional locksmith and then years later I didn't know where he was I just know he didn't come home and that's mm -hmm. when I called you and y'all came over and changed the locks so and I remember when I actually physically caught him cheating and I felt like I had to say my words to her because she was somebody who was at my wedding her you know he was that was his so supposed best friend right um and somebody I had welcomed into my home so I understand the betrayal to you know somebody like her and that's why I don't have respect for you, you know the other like the other woman he had a yeah. whole family your ex-husband had a whole family, had a wife of 22 years that helped, you know, nurse him back to health, right? You you got him off his deathbed. Uh, how many times did you even get him off his deathbed? Because it wasn't just once. Mm -mm. I, I, at least, like, really bad hospital stays, I'll say probably a good five in the past eight years. Somebody who's been and you helped build his business. There's no way in the world he would have had been able to build a business without you. Right. All these things that you're doing. And that man still stepped out like that's the crazy. It's like that's why I tell women, look, I'm telling you right now, girl, you could swing off the chandelier. You could do whatever you think, you know, you're going to you know, oh, I'm, he's not going to cheat because I'm doing all these things. You can be the best person that you want to be. Okay. And I'm not saying that, Hey, every man, no, absolutely not. Mm -hmm. But what I'm saying is it, do your best. You put your best foot forward in a relationship. Right. But people choose to cheat. That was a choice he made. Right. And that was a choice she made. So if anybody's out there who's considering being the other woman, just know, I ain't got no respect for you. I don't have any damn respect for you whatsoever um, because you're choosing to deal with a married man. And when you knowingly know that that person is married and you still lay down with him, there is no respect for you whatsoever. Um, and and, there's really, no respect for yourself. And if I could mm -hmm. just share that, that's really what put the nail in the coffin of our marriage mm -hmm. that I was telling you, I don't feel value and respected or loved in this relationship and you go and have an affair yep. instead of trying to take that time and energy to show me you do love me. You do respect me. You do honor me. So that mm -hmm. was, 
in my journey that when someone tells you who they are even though he's been showing me for 22 years and i ref i made excuses for him and you know why i didn't tell people what was going on because of shame and embarrassment mm -hmm. you know that you're yep. allowing someone to control and dictate your emotions your feelings what you do mm -hmm. how you dress you know you don't you know you're embarrassed because you know it's not right so you're not proud of yourself mm -hmm. so you're you, you know anyway so that was really what made me um file for divorce just knowing that he didn't take the time and energy to show me he valued and loved me instead he went and slept with someone else you mm. know so that was it and that's when i'm telling you my divorce papers i signed i filed on october 13 2022 my birthday remember it was the right feeling because i was not crying i was actually happy and let mm. me tell you i didn't know how i was going to pay for this divorce because remember i lost a business so i lost an average about 5k a month in, in income and we even had a conversation mm -hmm. about that this was pre me cutting him off him saying that he didn't understand why i wouldn't come back to him that i i, I prefer to struggle financially than be back with him and i said girl that is playing the victim he's playing the victim right instead of being accountable for his actions it's like oh you you would rather do you know while i'm over here hurting dude you chose this this yeah. was your choice you chose to step out on the relationship. So no, absolutely not. There's, you're not gonna, no, you're not gonna play the victim over here. It was your choice to deal with somebody. So it was just all these things, but let me tell you, I don't regret it. I don't regret leaving him I, struggling because I'm just happier. Like it's not even, it's not, a, and that's what some people don't understand. It's not, it has nothing to do with the money. Like I'm struggling, but I'm the happiest I've been in years. And just like you said, he could have put that energy into you, the marriage, the house, the family. And instead, he chose to put that same energy he could have given you, you know, into somebody else. So why in the world would you sit there and be like, oh, yeah, I, I will be your your second or third best because you don't know how many women there's been. Yeah, I'll, I'll stick around and I'll be your doormat. And the thing is, it, it, and you know what, the reason why, and I'm just well, right here in my position. But the reason why, like when you were signing those papers it, and there's a big difference in, you know, somebody who stays after a partner cheats and someone who bounces when a partner cheats. And that really is you look at it, be like, hmm, was I the best wife that I could have been? Did I make mistakes? You know, did I do my own thing? Was I not paying attention to my spouse? If, if, they, if the questions are like. No, I wasn't the best wife. Then those are the ones that will, you know, typically rethink it and say, you know what, I'm going to stay in this marriage because, damn, maybe I wasn't fulfilling all his needs. But you were sitting there happily signing the paper because we've, you know, we've talked about this before. You were doing everything. You were, you were doing every single thing to make that marriage work. And so, therefore, when you found out that he betrayed you, it was like, you know what, no. I'm good. Deuces. I'm out. I'm going to just take my pennies and I'm going to move out because my peace of mind is everything. So I think that is why you could sign the papers and you would probably even maybe giggling a little bit internally because you know that you were the best wife you could have been to him. I did. I did. I definitely feel that, you know, and I definitely agree with you. I mean, don't get me. I was not perfect. I learned how to control my emotions. That's something I wasn't taught as a kid. So toxic from a marriage where he had his own trauma who he never refused to deal with, you know? I've had my own childhood trauma, which I'm gonna deal with because I don't mm -hmm. wanna live like this. I don't wanna live unhappy, on whole. I wanna feel purposeful. I wanna fit, feel like I'm in control of my own life, you know? And um, I definitely felt like I was a great wife, you know? I, I, mm -hmm. I, I definitely don't think I was perfect. Um, but you know, he told me um, one of his excuses for having an affair after the first excuse um, was that because I started taking care of myself, he thought I was having an affair. And I just started taking care of myself because I started loving myself. And between your podcast and, you know, your sessions with you, my therapist, you know, I just started to really do things that I really loved, which I love fashion. I love getting dressed up, putting on cute clothes. Um, there's just a lot of things I'm discovering about myself that I've always loved, but I stopped doing when I got married because my life became this mother and wife, and that's what had to change. And it bothered him, 
that I was really mm -hmm. loving myself and putting myself first. That is a true narcissist, right? You know, cause they, like you said, they want to be the center of the world and then you put yourself first and it's like, wait a minute, you're disrupting the ecosystem. They don't mm -hmm. want you to love yourself. Mm -hmm. They want you to only focus and, you know, I'm, you know what, I, let me mention this though, because you, this is way back in the beginning of the conversation, you said that you noticed that like holidays, they would, he, he would even try to, you know, mess that up. And you, girl, that would, that was a red flag that I missed too. You live and learn. So let's talk about the living and learning part because the Jessica today is not the same Jessica that was in the marriage, not even the one from a year ago. Just like I'm not the same person I was, you know, in my marriage 10 years ago, right? We live and we learn. So what are some lessons that you have learned about yourself that you know that you are not going to repeat again? Well, one thing, um, I'm definitely going not settle. I won't settle anymore. Um, I'm definitely, you know, I still believe in love and the fairy tale romance because I'm just a romance kind of girl. So I definitely believe in that, but I'm not going to settle. And if, you know, I don't find it, then I don't find it. But I'm learning to love being okay, just being by myself. That in itself is rewarding as someone who's been raised as a codependent and didn't know how to be alone. So mm -hmm. that's one thing I will never go back. Like now I'd be like, oh my gosh, my mom and my daughter drive me crazy. Like I need my own place, you know, mm -hmm. but that's one thing I, I think I'm, I'm so happy. I'm, I'm learning. I'm still in the process. You know, do I get lonely sometimes? Sure. Um, but I've learned that, you know, through yoga, meditating, reading, um, there's just so many avenues to help you when you're feeling those emotions of loneliness and I, you know that I think there's just so many resources out here for anyone to not really um, grow. There's just, you know between like listening to podcasts, there's coaches, there's there there's just so many resources out yep. there that really help you to understand you. And that's the beauty of it. I'm understanding me, what I like. Mm -hmm. I'm different. I am unique. I am a little weird, but mm -hmm. that's okay. That's me. That's what makes mm -hmm. me special. And someone that is really gonna love me for me, they're gonna love me for me. You know, and I, I feel like I hit a lot of that of myself being married to to my ex was mm -hmm. I had changed who I was. I've always been a free spirit. I've always been, you know, a little more artsy girl than, you know, your typical, you know, <laughs> wife that I, you know, Christian wife that I was where, I, you know, I realized like I'm more into my spirituality as far as like understanding the mm -hmm. the science behind it. Right. The spiritual part. Mm -hmm. So I'm, done, I'm, I'm on my journey. I'm on my journey now with that. And I'm still learning every day. And I think that's the beautiful thing. Like I'm learning what I like, what I don't like, mm -hmm. how I want to pray to God, how I want to exercise, how I want to meditate. And it's just like discovering all these new passions or these new things that you're really good at. Or you like, I love journaling now. I'm really good at that. You know, and I just, just tapping into those things to help me because I, I am still struggling with different mental issues uh, because I have been diagnosed with ADHD, PTSD, anxiety. Um, mm -hmm. So those are all things like I'm learning to navigate and, you know, and mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's, it's still so rewarding. Like it's tough. It's hard work, but it is so rewarding, you know, because I'm understanding my brain. I'm understanding me, why I do things the way mm -hmm. I do, why I don't do things, uh, you know, and that mm -hmm. is okay to say no, right? Those are a few things that I think I've learned on this journey. That There's women out here. There's a lot of people who stay in relationships just to say they have a relationship, you know, because, and I'm very cautious about, oh, they've been together 35 years, but girl, them 35 years could have been in hell. We celebrate longevity, but not knowing what's going on in the marriage and not to say that they need to put it on blast. Like I said earlier, because you did a really good job when, you know, we were strictly just friends. I did not know everything, right? You did a really good job keeping up the facade going the church right you know when my sister was alive she would tell me all the time like i will go to church um but my sister would always say no i don't want you know no because it'd be the fakest people and i'm not putting down church all i'm saying is everybody in church isn't praying to the same god they're not living the life that people think oh because they go to church they could babysit our kids y'all don't know people Really, and don't classify people, you know, just because, oh, they're church going. You don't know what goes on behind closed doors, you know, just because somebody goes to church doesn't make them a Christian. Okay. Yeah. You know, it just doesn't. Mm. I could see that with my ex. Mm -hmm. He was going to church mm -hmm. and his actions spoke total opposite of that. And that, that, that also led me to my own journey to kind of 
start doing my own research on what I want, you know, why is Christianity the only way, you know, what other religions are out there? You know, if I was born in Asia, I might be a Buddhist, like, yep. you know, so really, you know, I just started questioning my faith and, you know, I still believe in God. I still pray. I no longer go to church or affiliate with a, as a Christian. Um, but, you know, now I build my own altar in my house and I'm learning more about like um, our ancestors and praying to them and kind of some African culture stuff. Um, so I'm still in the beginning phases of reading those books. But, um, yeah, I've opened my mind to a whole new world of just um, and I feel connected more. You meet somebody who's stuck in a very unhappy, loveless marriage and they're just trying to write it out, either write it out until the kids graduate high school. And it's like the kids know. Like the kids know mommy and daddy don't like each other. I don't know why people do that. It's like, look, you're not doing the kids any service, any, any due diligence by staying in a loveless marriage. You know, no, you and know. let me just tell you, I also had to accept that staying in that marriage for as long as I mm -hmm. did, really, now my kids have mental issues that they have to deal mm -hmm. with because of it. Now I have to live with that, you know, and I mm -hmm. apologize to all three of my children. I didn't know better. I yep. know better now and I'm going to do better. Because I do want healthy relationships in my life. That includes mm -hmm. my children. Um, and they're adults now. But yeah, I mean, what you're saying, that that definitely resonates with me because staying only hurt my kids. Mm -hmm. It does. So what advice would you give the woman who's in that situation, who's who's staying just because they think it's for the, the betterment of their children? If you could talk to her one-on-one, -on -one, what would you say? Um, the thing I would say most than anything, it, it, one is they create a safe space. And I think as women, sometimes we don't have enough women or we feel like we have to do things on our own because we, you know, we always try to be strong and this and that. And we just don't have mm -hmm. like what, what I've learned is kind of like a sister circle, right? Where you have some women that are going to encourage you and empower you and, um, mm -hmm. but also not judge you. That's what we mean by safe space, because, mm -hmm. you know, I have a sibling right now I'm working through with this, that she just left her significant other like 13 years. And she's struggling because just like me, she's a codependent. So that feeling of loneliness mm -hmm. that she has suffers with depression. So many women that stay because it's easier, because they don't know how to survive on their own or they don't know how they'll make it on their own. I mean, let's face it, this world is hard. And with a one person income, it just seems impossible. You know, so there's a lot of people out there that stay for the wrong reasons, but I just encourage once you start really tapping into loving yourself, you're going to want that, that, that freedom from, from anything negative that's holding you back. So what does your dating life look like now? Have you started dating again? I have, um, I'm still, you know, in the learning, I've been listening to a lot of your dating podcasts just because, <laughs> um, it's hard out here. I mean, after you've been married for 22 years, you, mm -hmm. I, and let's face it, I got married really young. So was I ever really in the dating pool when I got married? And, you know, we're living a day and age of apps and social media. So it, it, it's a different ball game out there. Um, but I have, I have gone on a few dates. I've gotten stood up a couple of times. It's just, just a learning experience. Um, I am learning from what I've gotten a lot from a lot of your podcasts is about being less masculine because I think, in my marriage, I I felt like I've always had to be the one to solve problems, always had to be the one to take care of everything. And I always was the person taking care of everything. So now it's like, well, I'll do everything myself. I don't need a man, you know? So yep. when I go on dates, like, you know, I'll, I'm learning that, you know, that that's not how I should be all the time, right? Some real men, at least, real men mm -hmm. desire um, a feminine woman. And mm -hmm. uh, I'm learning that. And that's something I'm working mm -hmm. on. That's how I learned from your uh, podcast. There's something else that was really meaningful. Oh, about dating, right? Like uh -huh. dating anywhere, right? It could be a gym. It could be um, a coffee shop because it's true. Why do you want to waste so much time and money mm -hmm. on a first date and you don't yep. even really like them? So that was something that resonated with me. So now I'm more open to like, you know, different mm -hmm. kinds of dates, which is funny. On my way back from Ghana, I did meet someone that we exchanged numbers. And mm -hmm. actually asked me on an actual date, which is pretty cool. So, and I, I'm, I'm like trying to listen to you in my head when I'm making decisions, like not talking, <laughs> like he works, he's a busy man. He's, you know, mm -hmm. and um, I don't know where it'll end up, but I'm just trying to go with the flow and just let the universe do what it do. But, um, you know, I think it's kind you, you can notice when you're meeting someone that genuinely likes you for you versus someone who wants something from you or just sex from you or whatever. So 
you know, that's kind of really cool. So I don't know where this will go. It's new, literally like a week. I met him a week ago. So <laughs> I'm going to go on my, our first date next week. So okay. He's coming okay. here. Two hour drive. He's coming here to me. Okay. He got his own hotel room. Um, he's taking me out to a gala. Um, so, and it's actually a, a gala that I'm, I'm on the board from the planning board and it, we honor the military and first responders. He happens to be a police officer. So it's kind of working out kind of cool. So as they say, like when manifesting period, like, you know, we have to be indifferent to the outcome. You know, that means getting out here when you're trying to manifest anything, you have to be indifferent to the outcome. And mm -hmm. dating is no different. You got to be indifferent to, you know, hey, instead of, oh, I can see a future. It's like, wait a minute, wait a minute. If you stay present, right, it's fine. You know, you just say day by day, I'm just getting to know somebody. I'm getting yeah. to know a new person. And I'm in, in the process, I'm going to have a good time getting to know a new person. That really takes the stress off of dating. It's like, you know, because we stress ourselves out when we go too far into the future. Oh, I think... I can see us taking vacations to Tahiti. And it's like, wait a minute, you don't know this person. You don't get to know this person. Every opportunity of engagement, of conversation, going out, like it's just for me to continue to get to know them. And that's how you really enjoy the dating process. So I have no doubt that you will be just, just fine, but we, we still chat. I may have went to a women's empowerment in Ghana and was with five or six other women, but that travel was all me by myself all the way to Africa not knowing mm -hmm. anybody, you know, a layover in, um, and I had one in Ethiopia, you know, which mm -hmm. is a crazy airport if you've ever been to it. Like, you have the buses and the planes on the same runway, just like passing each other. It was the weirdest thing <laughs> in my life. You get off the plane <laughs> on the tarmac. Um, I was in an unfamiliar country, barely know the language, or I don't know the language at all. Um, mm -hmm. but doing it scared, there's just something that when you conquer it, you're like, dang, I did that shit. Yep. Oh, you know, and you know, I think that's where the beauty comes because I was scared shitless leaving. I was 22 mm -hmm. years with security mm -hmm. financially, anyway. You know, this is something I learned on my retreat from one of my leaders was mm -hmm. that we're the only species that gets that gut feeling instinct and we don't follow it. And mm. I was like, hey, so think about that. Any other animal in the world, they get that, they're going out, they're going to trust that instinct. Mm, exactly. that's a great point that's they a great point their own you know they question their own things and it's like like i can remember my marriage like the day i got married which was in city hall because we were broke in brooklyn new york i'll never forget i did not want to get married that day i remember telling myself don't do it jessica but because i didn't want to hurt his feelings i did it anyway you know so it's mm -hmm. just those things that you look back and you're like i knew i should have never married him and over the years, mm. I always threatened, you know, I was going to leave. or, And then until finally, I just got the courage to say, you know what? I'm done. I'm done. So mm. I was encouraged. Now you got to trust yourself. You didn't trust yourself before. You know, mm. and then you were not only that, you were people pleasing. You've been a people pleaser for so long that you put everybody else before you. You even married somebody else. You married him because you put him before you. So mm. the new Jessica is not doing that anymore. Mm -hmm. So let's welcome the new Jessica and let's keep honoring the new Jessica. And I do push women to, I, I tell people go on these solo trips. It's empowering, you know, and if you can't go on a solo trip, then do a retreat. Yes, do a retreat. Because you, you're not alone. You're there. You're alone because you don't know anybody else. But you have the activities. But and it's all about focusing on you. So if people don't want to go across the world by themselves, but please do a retreat. So, and I'm going to, I'm looking to have a retreat next year. I don't know where, but I'm thinking somewhere on the continent of Africa. Um, you know, I don't know where though. Uh, well, you I mean, know, I've had a few women that have been messaging me like, <laughs> You know, because, and then that's another thing. That's why I was willing to do this because you're right. People do need to hear this because I have so women that slide up on my DMs and I'm just very open now on my social media that I'm living my best life and I'm unapologetic about it, you know, but now I have other women that are like, what are you doing? What? I, I see the glow. Like I want yep. that, you know? And yeah. And all <laughs> I can do is to give them the resources that help me. <laughs> No, I not girl. I definitely that's why I asked you to be on the show because I can't because I know it's not like I know all my clients like beforehand, but I know I know you. Yeah. I know you and I, I remember the old you. Now. 16, yeah. 
Yep. I remember the old you. That's always been important to me too, exercise. And my ex, who was very ill, in order to live, they pretty much told him, you got to eat right, exercise, and take your Mm -hmm. medicine. Because it's a a combination of genetic, fat diet, right? And not taking your medicine. So that's why he's sick. So I would try. Let's go. Let's join a gym together. Let's walk together. Let. I couldn't get him to do nothing. Nope. <laughs> Not even a walk around the block after dinner. None of that. Mm. And he was on it. And he was the one that was on his deathbed. Is. Mm-hmm. Many times, as you said. So, nope. You know, I'm going to say, Jessica, please continue to glow up. Uh, continue to honor yourself. Put yourself first, girl. You deserve it. You don't have minor children anymore. Girl, you come first. Them, them babies grown. They no longer come first anymore. They were, they came first when they were two, four, and six. They not that age anymore. Well, I want to thank you again, Jessica, for um, spending your afternoon with me. So um, everyone, thank you again for listening to another episode of Let's Be Mindful, where we talk about everything relationships. So until the next time, take care.